everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of Honest Discussions. I'm your host, Dr. Rannon Patterson, and today we are going to talk to a bright young mind in Inga Steindahl. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the James Cook University in Australia, and her work is really fascinating. She has developed uh, models using cave fish which are those cool fish that live inside caves that turn albino and lose their eyesight. But they turn out to be great models for studying things like convergent evolution, non-visual photopigments, and uh, circadian rhythms. We had a really delightful conversation that talked about the research she's done now and her future research, which surrounds studying the breeding cycles of corals and how light and light pollution can affect those. And we also talk about just what it's like to be a postdoctoral researcher in 2023 with all of the benefits and all of the hurdles too. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And before we get to the show, if you could please like, share, subscribe. The channel is growing, and uh, but we need your help to get to that 1,000 subscriber mark so we can get monetized so I can blow this platform up into what it's really meant to be. And uh, any help would be appreciated. So on that note, on with the show. Yeah, well, actually, now I'm working with corals, but I uh, I think cave fish will always kind of keep close to my heart. So I'll I'll try and explain my rationale behind all of this. So um, I grew up in Norway. Um, the university is really close to where I've grown up, so I kind of felt I needed to get out, basically. Um, and so I, because I speak English, I thought, oh. Britain is a good it's a good place place to go speak English um, close to home relatively a couple of hours of flying and um, got into a, a very good university and I started a molecular biology degree and I've always found so many of these things fascinating with I've always thought chemistry was interesting never really got the hang of physics biology is super cool and I guess when you do a molecular biology degree, everything is so focused on model organisms. And then you always try and translate what happens in a model organism, usually to humans, but also sometimes to, to other systems or animals. And then when I did my, my undergrad and master's, also we had the rise of, of sequencing, right? All of a sudden all these genomes came out and suddenly you could do molecular biology that used to only be available to people who worked on drosophila fruit flies or with mice or rats all of a sudden that kind of became available to almost any animal that had a genome sequenced and somebody else would usually pay for it um or maybe you'll pay for it yourself but there was all of a sudden there were these um tools available that we, we could use um and then I started um, one of the courses I did during my undergrad was a circadian rhythm course and a light biology course. And I found it super fascinating. And at the same time, I was doing a project in a cancer lab, which I thought and, and kind of hearing about, you know, that, that was my first kind of dip into academia, that lab. And, and the lab work was so much fun. Um, it was um cell culture based assays um so i learned a lot of stuff and um the tech who worked there used to work for the guy who ran the circadian uh, course so i asked her oh is he nice you know should i should i go um and, and do my masters there and she said yeah absolutely you should really go so and and he had worked on cave fish before um they've been to mexico to these caves so i should probably say a bit about about the cave fish themselves so um there are about 300 now different species of cave fish in the world true cave fish um that is fish that kind of always live in caves they don't ever swim out of the caves they're always kind of trapped in the caves and um they're only in like 2000 and 
10. I think they only knew about 150-ish species or something like that. So they have really discovered a lot of new species um, every year. And particularly in China, they're finding a lot of new cavefish species. Um, almost every year there's like maybe four or five new new species that are being described. So it's, it's a fascinating um it's a fascinating field. Um, Speaking of China, I really feel for those people right now. Have you heard anything about the flooding there? Have you seen any of it? No, I, I think it's also I because there's a flooding in Norway, so my my head has been very focused on the. But I I think there's very there's a lot of underreporting about the what goes on in Asia in general, unless it's economics. I think. Yeah, it's so bad. You can't believe it, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And but uh, the reason that made me think of that is with all of that flooding, uh, you're going to have a mixing of uh, populations of fish between the surface fish and the cave fish. Yes. Yeah. So that's usually how the cave fish come to be. They're not fish that have kind of always evolved in caves. They are fish that um, have been trapped from from the surface and they've been trapped in rivers and um, that could happen if there is a drop in water level it could happen if there is a flooding and then the water recedes or it could happen over you know a long geological time where water levels drop um, and in in Mexico the the fish that I've been working with these limestone caves you know there's so many different little hollows that have been dug out um, through time. Well, and supposedly by the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, but that remains <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> um, but the um, um, the cavefish that we have in, in, in Mexico, um, there's, there's a couple of different species, actually, but the most kind of well-known one, the, the one that we call the Mexican blind cavefish, um, is really cool because it has about over 30 different caves um, over a relatively large um, large area in, in Mexico that also extends a bit into the US and, and Guatemala. And there's lots of these different caves and the same species have been trapped in these different caves. And um, they think um, that they have evolved kind of independently in these caves, at least some of them that are very, very far apart, although it's impossible to tell whether there are underground systems that they can swim. And of the course, fish. yeah, you don't know how much real intermixing can happen without sampling all of these different caves and doing yeah. genome sequencing for a bunch yeah. of replicates and then compare yeah. all of those and you could you could trace it, but still be yeah, a proper a proper population genetic study would be needed to determine that, which is um, it's going to be difficult because part of the problem with the cave fish is that I think people kind of think of caves and they think of these like big holes in the wall, you know, that and you can kind of walk in and there's a cave in there and whatever. And that's just not the case in most cases it's like this tiny little slit in the ground and you have to like in most cases you can't even get into well, um the, the the spelunkers that scares the that scares me to death when you watch those people go through these crazy caves and they're slithering through 12 inch gaps and on their hands and knees and it's like uh yes yeah. And then you have cave diving, which is even more um, sketchy, right? Oh, you yeah. Have to do the water. <laughs> there was that UFC fighter, Donald Cerrone. He almost died cave diving. He got lost. He lost his partner, lost the rope to get back out, like had a few minutes of air left and found the rope and yeah. was able to get out. Jesus, Meanwhile, yeah. the person he was looking for was already out. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty dangerous stuff. Um, so the cavefish remain kind of a, a pretty elusive species to study because of that. There are a couple of caves that are easy to get to where you can actually kind of sit around um, for a couple of hours, but it's, it's not pleasant, right? Um, and the cool thing with the Mexican blind cavefish is that there are 
still the founding um, mothers and fathers of this species is still swimming around in the rivers. And in a couple of caves where they're, they're, that are particularly flood prone, they still kind of often intermix. So you get the surface um, fish mixing with the cave fish. Um, and I think people get fascinated with the cave fish because they're blind and because they're white. And, and that is because they have evolved to a life in the dark. And almost all the different cave fish species that we see and also other things like cave invertebrates, you know, any insects, um, spiders, um, they all go white. They all lose their pigment and they, use, they lose their eyes as well. And... There has been some debate for a time why they do that, but it looks at least for the Mexican blind cave fish that the eyes really have a high metabolic demand um, and the brain as well. So when you, when you reduce your eye size and, and you also then reduce the processing center in your brain, your optic tectum, then you don't need as much um, energy for that. So when they've done these metabolic studies on the cave fishes, they find that the cave fish use a lot less energy than their counterparts, which of course might be for a, for a, for a lot of reasons, but they think it's part part of that. It, at least it makes simplistic um, and, sense. And it makes sense at some level because you would expect there to be a more limited availability of caloric intake in that kind of an environment. Now, granted, it is an ecosystem and things are breeding and evolving and you know breeding and growing that you know there is food source clearly but yeah but it may but just it is, become much more limited yeah it is it is much more scarce and it may also be a bit more seasonal so places where you have monsoon rains for example you know the rain might um might transport more detritus you know um litter from 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 the from the rainforest or the forest around, you know, leaves or the insects that might fall down. Um, so you might have to cope for a long time without any um, any food or very little food. Um, right, so and, th and that would drive down the, uh, well, you would have to reduce your body requirements energy-wise to be able to survive. So yeah, exactly. there go the evolution. There were a few. There were a number of things about your work that made me want to talk to you. First off, I didn't even know that uh, there were non uh, what non visual non photocopies. Yeah, yeah, so I didn't even know that those existed. They uh, humans have them as well. Um, so. Non-visual photopigments are very similar to the visual pigments that we have in our eyes, right? Our, our rods and cones. And uh, in humans, we have we also have them. Uh, we have the non-visual ones. So basically, they can't form an image anymore, but they can still detect light. They still have the ability to detect light. And we have them in, in our skin, for example. And, you know, it makes sense because our skin gets subjected to dna damage from the sun etc so it's you know having having the ability to detect that you are being subjected to to potential damage and being able to turn on your um your dna repair machinery for example uh, makes makes sense and uh, you also see it, you know, in, in like mice ears and things like that. So the mammals have a lot less of it. It has been lost in mammals, but in, in reptiles and in fish, there are the, the diversity of both visual and non-visual photopigments is crazy. Um, so well, I guess I know about me uh, melanin, you know, yeah. and I guess I didn't think about that as a, uh, a light receptor, but clearly it is because it's sensing the light. And uh, I thought maybe it had something to do with UV sensing or something, but no, it's so. Are there well, like there's uh, lots of different ways for for the body to like um, your mitochondria, for example, can also absorb light. So there's more ways to absorb light and detect light or use light than just your photopigments. Um, but I think it's a really underexplored piece of biology um and 
Yeah, like, like the zebrafish, for example, we know that they have 32 different non-visual photopigment genes that all code for different photopigments that can all absorb different spectrums of light. And what, why do you need 32? You know? Well, let me ask you this. So do, all, do these photopigment uh, receptors, uh, are they all metal containing or are there ones that don't even have metal in them? Do you know? Uh, so there, there are some t types, but that we don't classify them as, as auxins than as photopigments. So they all have the ability of absorbing a photon. There are all these transmembrane proteins that have the ability to absorb a photon and then send out a, a signal from that. And then some of them are different. Some of them need to have the retinal recycled so they can go back into the confirmation that it can absorb light again, like the photopigments in our eyes. Um, and, um, and other ones are actually can absorb in different confirmations. Um, and so, for example, uh, and we've known about this in, in humans, I think, since the 80s or 90s. So... Melanopsin is, is probably the most famous non-visual photopigment in, in humans. They are also found in, in the eyes and is the reason why people who are blind actually can still maintain a circadian rhythm. So they can still perceive light and their body can still tune their body clock to it, but they can't actually see because it's not their rods. Their rods and cones are damaged, but it's but their melanopsin melanopsin isn't um there the brain is a, an amazing thing because there's like a weird uh consciousness disorder where that you you can't people have had brain damage where they can't visualize what they're seeing in the you know one half of their spectrum one eye they don't they don't recognize as they're seeing it but when they do behavioral studies and they do things in the field that they absolutely cannot perceive, it still influences their behavior. So they're absolutely aware of it subconsciously, but it doesn't make it into the conscious level. So the, you know, brains are wild and neurons are wild and can do, and neurons also transmit light, as you said, uh, highly understudied area of, how light is used you know by life itself most people don't know that the light in your eyes is actually real like anything that is a transmitter is all or any anything that's a receptor is also a transmitter so people really do have uh the light in your eyes that's shining you know but yeah but as to your question or as to your statement about all the different colors of uh, photopigments or that they can get different wavelengths of light. I mean, I could envision, especially in a, in a water environment and the way that, that light is filtered through water and would be filtered differently through clear water versus muddy water versus algae ridden water versus, you know, name your type of water. You would have yeah. a wildly different spectra going on all the time so maybe the, like for something like fish they just need that many to be really aware of what's going on in their environment at some level yeah it, it could be um the thing though with with the with these photopigments is that the kind of peak absorptions is over 200 nanometers or so so you can actually absorb quite a, a lot of you know, a, a lot of different wavelengths within one of these photopigments. So it's not like it, it has a very narrow band where you can actually only like go. So it's not really like a filter. They're all kind of just open. If it's above UV, they can kind of see it. Well, it will, it will be kind of like vaguely blue, blue, green, green, yellow, you know, within these. Um, so it doesn't, simplistically it doesn't make sense that there are so many of them and the other thing that is is strange at least in the little fish and i don't know whether it applies to larger fish um is that we also find the photopigments in the internal organs there are less of them but they're still there so you find them in the liver the gut you know the heart 
and you can take the heart out. You can take in, in zebrafish, um, you can take any organ out in culture and you can subject it to a light dark cycle and you can still see beautiful molecular and trained rhythms. So they have the ability to detect light and, 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 and synchronize their body clock cells to, to light. They don't need ice at all. And, and the same with the, the cave fish that don't really have proper eyes. Um, their cells are the same. They, you can take the, the cells, um, and, and you can spread it on a dish and same, same thing with the zebra fish and, and you can subject it to a light dark cycle and, and they have, they have clocks. They can, they can use their, um, they can use their direct light biology. Um, it, it's pretty incredible. Um, and the question is, you know, uh, why and or why have we lost it in, in mammals you know it's 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 a really fascinating and, and how much of you know how important is it for the animal because because when you kind of research it they almost look like um you know these swimming photoreceptors right they're ready to basically absorb any light that you give them and in the environment that humans have created there are so much light pollution and and i don't really think we understand it's a, i would call it a silent polluter because people don't really see it because they're so used to it it's a bit like if you used to a lot of noise you don't really notice it in a way but it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect you or or the animals um around you you know that the ecosystem you surround yourself with well number one from from where you're from you have some of the best night skies on the planet. I feel bad because, you know, there's tens of millions of people in the United States that have never really seen the stars because of like never in their whole life. Yes. I lived on a ranch out in the middle of nowhere, California for a number of years where every night you could see the Milky Way. That'll change your perspective on everything when you can actually see the sky and actually see all the stars and realize that we're a part of a much bigger thing when you live in the city i mean you're lucky if you can see the most prominent stars in the midnight sky you know in the midnight sky really yeah so uh here was my next thing that i wanted to talk about a little bit because I'm a cell biologist, and uh, cell biology at some levels comes under attack sometimes because, uh, well, you're just working in a model system, and you're just working in a cell culture, and you're just, you know, you're you're not looking at it in the 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 whole or, the whole organism, and can you really yeah. take anything yeah, sure. from your studies and Meanwhile, I applaud you for making these uh, caves or the cave fish cell lines that are now going to be available for use uh, if people want to research with them. And I, I don't think I just want to put out there that uh, there's been so much discovered in cell lines that it's stupefying. Actually, most of the foundations that we know about in all of biology most of that the most of the foundational work comes from cell biology and cell lines i mean we just had are you familiar with hela cells yeah that that yeah. court case just ended here last week wow. in the united states where the family of helen i forget her last name and uh, Lex. yes yeah. uh her family was finally awarded after her cells have been used by practically every cell biologist in the world for the last 30 years or 40 years. Yeah. So uh, maybe you could tell, tell, tell me a little bit about how you developed the cell lines. Was it hard? Uh, and, you know. Yeah. Um so, yeah, I, I, I think that the cell lines are going to have a new, I think they're going to have a renaissance because um, 
there has been a really big push in, in the West recently, I think the last kind of four or five years to really stop using animals for research. And I think there's good reasons for that. And then if you want to continue to do research, you have to test it on, on something. And I think cell lines kind of come up as a, as a pretty easy and cheap way of, of doing things, at least initially. Of course, you can't really, there's, there's lots of questions you can't really uh, answer with cell line studies, but there are lots of them that you can, to, can do. And you can also, you know, it's a great starting point for many things. You know, things might not be worth um, pursuing in, in an animal model if, if you already kind of tried it initially in cell lines and you see that actually, you know, that hypothesis doesn't really work. Um, so with the, with the cavefish, because they are so rare and when I wanted to do research with them, you know, often it would take so long and, and as people in academia know, but perhaps not outside of academia is that every, all the work you do is normally within very short time frames, right? You get two, three, or maybe five years to execute a project. So that means that you can't wait for six months or a year or two years for something to, to happen, an animal to grow. You know, the, there are these long lines don't really exist um, in, in granting agencies because everything is, is determined by who is paying your salary and for your research at the time. And they usually want results relatively quickly. And, Unrealistically. And but yeah. we'll leave that yeah. alone for a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so therefore, you know, used to work with, with zebrafish. They lay eggs every other day. They're sexually mature after three, four months, you know, so that, that they have a relatively quick turnover, particularly compared to, to other lab animals like mice. The cavefish, on the other hand, they... Um, they kind of only lay every three weeks, maybe four, maybe two if you really push them, but the, the embryos are not going to be very viable. And then in the UK, at least, you, you're allowed to use the embryos without any, um, without any extra ethics for the first five days, and then you have to discard them. You're not allowed to use them anymore, or you have to have a permit to, to work with them. So... Uh, that's mind-boggling, found... actually, to me. A little bit for yeah, the... for fish embryos. Yeah, the the very rapid at developing, so they're already free swimming after twenty four hours. But you know, a lot of these things are the set um, against mice. I think you know a lot of because yeah. Anyway, I can talk about how a lot of these things for fish are really weird, uh, the rules, like you have to have HEPA filtered air when fish live in water, you know, so. See, this, know, is, th this is just insanity because these are the things that cost money out mm -hmm. of your project that you can never get back, that yeah. don't do anything to facilitate the research. Yeah, and it doesn't help the animals live a better life, right? Because... <laughs> If no, you, if, not at all. If you care about animal, you know, the welfare of, of your animals, then you want them to to live a, a good a life as possible when, when they're in the lab. And and um, HEPA filtered air is not going to do it. They also have strange rules for culling fish where you're supposed to, yeah, it's horrible. You're supposed to use um, Things that basically make them jump out of the water and try and kill themselves by beaching themselves, while the alternative is to put them in ice cold water and they die within a couple of seconds. That's not allowed. So it's these really strange, horrible rules. Um, and well, I can see why you're not a fan of uh, animal research. I mean, this is my feelings on animal research are that with the advent of organoids and our ability to grow them, uh, what what's better, testing in a macaque? Which, okay, it's barely related to humans, actually. I mean, even though they say, oh, well, it's, you know, 95% the same genome. None of their stuff, you know, is comparable to ours in many respects. So is, is, is using a macaque 
better than a liver organoid? I mean, I mean, it'd be really hard to, t you'd have to do studies to figure it out. But in my mind, yeah. the, the human liver organoid is likely to provide more human specific information than even a whole body macaque or chimpanzee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I really don't like the, the animal, a lot of the animal stuff I, I really don't like. I think a lot of the rules are, seems strange to me and i think that's also why i've also partly gone gone over to corals now for a, for a while um i'm getting out of corals as well because they're horrible to work with believe it or not um you didn't know that going into them single-celled organisms that build their own rock you thought that was going to be easy <laughs> you know and uh, there's, there's lots of there's lots of problems with the corals um <laughs> But, um, yeah, anyway, so uh, where were we with the... Oh, uh, with we were talking about, well, we were talking about the cave fish, the, uh, oh, banking the cell lines. Yeah, so, yeah. so, yeah, you have all these strict regulations. The one last thing I want to say before we go into that, what I've learned in stuff like HEPA filters for fish is that that was caused by uh completely by politics that this air you know these companies that make L air filters lobby to get administrators to put these kinds of crazy rules in because now there's a market that has to be filled that didn't exist before and that's how a lot of these very strange regulations actually come into being is through lobbyists for companies that want to sell more product, period. Yeah, but, sure. But anyways, um, the making the cell lines. So you had had to deal, don't want to deal with uh, the ways you have to euthanize <laughs> embryos. Well, no, all the, all the, all the adult fish themselves. And, and in the case of cave fish, they, you know, they, they can actually get really old. I think they can, upwards to 40 years which is which is very wow. old for a fish that is only like this big you know it's it's the it's the live live slow and, and live long kind of thing you know they don't eat much therefore they probably also live quite long put it simply um and um so i found that you know the the, the research that we wanted to do on them was was moving really slowly along and in zebrafish, it's super easy to make cell lines. You can take embryos after 24 hours and you can blow up the, the cells in them. So you basically have all of these stem cells in there and they attach to the cheapest plastic for cell culture that you can get. They are happy being overconfluent. They're not like human cells where you have to be very careful with them. They don't even require CO2. You can basically, if you put them as they are, um, both, both the zebrafish and the cavefish kind of live between 25, 28 ish. You can even leave them on the counter and they will grow a bit slower. Um, but they'll just keep going. Yeah. So, so really they're very, they have been really easy to make. Um, other species of fish have been more difficult, but I thought it's worth, it's worth giving it a go. Um, and particularly cause I'd just been, I'd done this study where I, every six hours throughout the first three days of development in four different cavefish strains were doing these sacrifices to find out when the clock, the body clock in the fish started and whether it differs between the different isolated cave strains. And that is just so painful, particularly because they didn't lay enough. So it was a very, very long project and I had to wait and then you have to be awake for three, four days every six hours and you live in a in, in the lab basically for that period of time. So I thought, okay, we, we need to kind of we we need to do something about this. So I, I tried it out with the with the cavefish um, embryos, did the same thing. It's they're easy to break up. Um, you can you can use this enzyme trypsin. Um, I think you can pretty much also do it just manually if you if you're uh, just titrating it very carefully yeah. with a pipette too. 
Yeah, basically you just blow up, right? It's just embryos are basically just blobs of, of cells in some kind of organized structure and, and then you can just blow them up and the cells are still alive. And then, um, yeah, you give them you give them nutrients and um, you give them these growth factors from fetal calf serum and um, and they are happy and and because they're also freshwater fish, you don't have to worry about salinity and things like that, which is a pain in, in marine species. Um, I'm so, sure. Yeah, so they turn out to be really, really simple to do, which I think is great because that means that anybody who has access to cavefish can do it themselves. They can also, you know, I'm also happy to, to ship them to anybody, but that means that you can take any of these 30 strains. I, I made them from, from three different cave strains and also the surface fish. So if you have any of the other ones, you can use it, and and you can use that if you if you want to study anything. You know, you can you can just use it as sam biological samples for studying DNA, anything within the DNA. You know, you want to do some sequencing of a new strain. You don't actually have to kill anything. You don't have to do any fin clips. You can just use the cells. Um, you can do a lot of the basic cell biology. You know, you can probably do um, a couple of metabolic studies and cell lines like that. Um, and yeah, so they turn out to be really, really simple to make. Um, I've also tried it for corals to make cell cultures from coral um, embryos. That is very, very difficult. And they only also spawn once a year. So you have one shot one every shot. year of doing it and they are impossible to deal with so you ha it's a bit of luck as well involved in these things I, well i've seen i've seen the david attenborough uh planet earth of the coral spawning have you seen that video it's yeah. really amazing i mean when you see it they all just go at once and it's this cloud of cells but yeah it happens once a year and yeah, so that's that's actually what I'm trying to work on now is to identify this mechanism that they are using for this mass broadcast spawning in corals because um, it's oh, a, cool. a lot of biology driven kind of phenomenon. Um, but the corals are, you know, they, they like to sell it to you as all the corals go, you know, everybody knows when they're going to go, they go once, that's it. But they kind of go, sometimes they go over a couple of months. There might be this, a couple of days after full moon over a couple of months. Sometimes they don't really go at all, especially now with the problem of the uh, coral bleaching and all the heat waves that we, we have. Um, and, and they require the whole year to basically gather enough nutrients um, to do one, one of these really big spawns. And when the quality is poor, um, they might choose to skip or they might just trickle a little bit um and um yeah so they they are much more it, it's not i mean it is pretty amazing on, on the reef because it does happen um yeah but i'm but sure they had to record for years to get that one bloom that was like worthy of putting on the show they didn't get that the first on their first try i guarantee it yeah they might have they, they, they pretty easy to when you take like this um up here in townsville we have a sea simulator um out of the marine station and um which is pretty amazing and then they house hundreds of corals during each spawning and and they do really like if you do put a camera there you will be able to to film it um but you might be there for several nights before it happens because knowing exactly what day post full moon they're going to go is not like sometimes it's day two sometimes it's day four sometimes it's day five so you have to you know you have to be there have every be night there. and look and wait and see um and then and, and and then you might get individual from one species that won't go because obviously we're taking the corals out of the sea and put them into a system an artificial system and then they get put back again after it's it's done but they get stressed by these things so um of course but yeah that is also another really cool bit of of light biology non-visual light biology where they can actually detect the very very faint full moon like if, imagine how little light 
comes from the full moon and then you filter it through water say down to 10 15 meters and then you have an animal that doesn't have eyes it, right they doesn't have any structures to detect photons um a specialized structure to detect photons and then they only rely on their non-visual photopigments to detect the moonlight to go okay full moon is now it's it's pretty incredible right like it is i mean for for the english uh speakers listening 15 meters is about 45 feet so oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty deep well i don't know why the whole world is not on the metric system. I mean, clearly, <laughs> as a scientist, base 10 is the easiest thing in the world. I'll never yeah. understand why America didn't change over. But uh, it, it really is. I mean, people could say, oh, well, you know, you can walk on a full moon, you can walk through the woods at night. And that's true. But you're... Yeah, but we have eyes. It, we, number one, we have eyes. Number two, we have eyes that are so sensitive to light that we can pick up a single candle at a mile or more, a candle lit, a, a human yeah. eye can pick up at a mile or more. Uh, so we have incredibly well-designed photoreceptors. And we're not yeah. 45 feet under the water, which yeah. may or may not have debris in it from a storm that may yeah. or may not have lots of uh, canopy over top of it because of uh, kelp or something growing and in, and yet they yeah. can still detect this tiny amount of light that must get down there. And yeah, so that was the f that's the first thing I've actually managed to do with these with these corals is actually to prove that they can detect it and that we actually do get a change in in the in the um, in the transcript levels of of the light sensitive genes that they have um which you know has only really been in the theory now but now we've finally managed to to actually say look you know it, they they are actually sensitive to that light which which yeah, is pretty incredible it didn't have to be the light that they were sensing it could have been magnetic something electromagnetic based on the full moon has a different you know uh electromagnetic <laughs> in interaction with the earth we see it because of how the tides change and things like this so it could have been something like that which would have been equally interesting but yeah yeah it's probably there's probably multifactorial you know what really sets up the spawning you know there's there's an important increase in temperature at least on the great barrier reef that happens you know a month or two before spawning all these different you know there's multi-factors that really feed into when they decide to go but but the timing of this massive release we we think is basically mostly down to the full moon because you can also replicate it in an aquarium where you don't you know where you only have led panels um and you can still get a synchronized mass spawning in in the aquarium that's awesome to me i find that really interesting yeah so, so uh maybe we maybe you should explain a little bit about why we even care about this? What circadian? We have what are circadian rhythms? Why? Why does light play such an important role in life on Earth? Even. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's really funny because it's the one thing that almost all animals do is they have some sort of of rhythm, and we really don't think about it because we're so used to it happening to us i don't but know if, if, if mine gets disturbed i think about it a lot <laughs> yeah well i think people notice their sleep but i think that's basically the only thing they really kind of notice is their sleep right which is one of the outputs of of a circadian clock is, is your sleep timing but if you think about it you know like when 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 life have evolved so much have happened, right? You've had glaciers forming, you have continents drifting backwards and forwards, you've had temperatures, you know, rising for, you know, there's been so much change, but the thing that has basically remained pretty constant is that the earth is spinning on its own axis, right? You have day night differences and it's tilting. So you also have seasonal differences, at least um, away from, from equator. You have these big changes in, in day um, length depending on what time of year it is and because of that um, 
that has always been so predictable that has kind of been engineered into the DNA of most organism that they use this rhythm to organize how they are going about their life from, you know, cyanobacteria up to humans. You know, we have an incredible, um, an, an incredible diversity of organisms that, that use it. Um, and if you think of, you know, like just, just, you know, are you day or night active, you know, um, does it make sense to replicate your DNA, right? So your, your cells open up and you expose your DNA. Should you really do it in the day while the UV acid at, at its harshest, where you are risking, you know, lots of damage or should you do it in the night? So you have all of these, you know, complex behaviors that are dictated by your circadian rhythm, like your sleep wake cycle, when you eat, to the very basic cell biology, like when your cell cycle is being timed. And we see it throughout lots of different animals. And then on top of that, we also have the very direct light biology um, that, you know, like DNA repair mechanism in a lot of animals, which depend on, on UV or um, in the corals, you know, we have the, the light that the full moon that actually dictates um, when they're going to spawn. So there is just so much and, and, you know, there are genes that are being turned on and off throughout a 24 hour period of time. So I think it's really interesting because a lot of, of, of researchers or biologists don't really care about it, but then often they might see changes because they might have done something at, in the morning versus the night. You know, if, if you think about when it just measuring blood pressure of a, of a patient, right? If you compare a, morning blood pressure versus a midday versus an evening you you get a big change and it's if you change sometimes yeah and if you if you would have looked at that without the time of day difference you'd be like oh my god something is seriously wrong with this person but if you look at it when it happens during the day you know that okay well so it is something that really you know is very important and we know that when we disrupt our clock we tend to get more sick um so there's been a couple of really big studies especially in nurses that do shift work that they have increased chances of, of cancer which might be due to the direct disruption it might also be due to the fact that people are generally less healthy when they have to do a lot of this disruptive shift work right you eat not as well um you might you might pick up more bad habits um etc etc but so it is really it is really key um, to our biology and well i mean people that work third shift die younger this yeah. is known people that have to work at night do tend to have immune system issues they do get sick more often they are subjected to a food desert because nothing's open at 4 a.m so they can only yeah. get what comes out of the vending machine. I mean, there's, just like you were saying, there's a ton of things that go wrong when yeah. you're... Probably both like the social aspects of it, like what you actually have available to you, but also combined with the fact that your clock is out of, of sync. And especially if you change your shift work all the time, like sometimes you work day shifts, others night shifts. So you kind of go back and forth. So your body never really gets to and train to a new rhythm, right? If you were only working night shifts, only working night shifts might not be as bad, but we don't really know because you can't really force people to do these kinds of, of things, right? I have a few friends that work factory jobs that work third shift consistently. One of them actually swears up and down that just prefers to work at night. Uh, however, it's really because of the there's less people it's less uh volatile so they just prefer it because it the the work itself is easier during the night yeah but he also will not deviate a schedule at all yeah so to and you know because if he does he really feels like hell so yeah you know if you want to even on days off and stuff, he's still on that night schedule and that's what keeps him rolling. Now I have a yeah. couple other friends that on their days off, they switch back to 
regular time because they have families and they have, you know, yeah. things that they have to take care of. And those people take a beating and you can yeah. just see it. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's definitely true. Um, but I, in, in a way it's weird that I was, I mean, I, one can understand why it is like that when they are post industrialized society, it kind of needs to have that, you know, people working, working shift jobs, but there is never, you know, there's no compensation schemes or anything like that for people's, you know, health or, or whatever. And it is something that is just generally not really, you know, there's just so many examples of, of, of why it is really important to be aware of it um, in, both in humans and also in, in nature in, in general. And, um, you know, like they, things like, and, and the thing, the, the funny thing is like a lot of it is pretty cheap and easy to, to do, right. It's, it's about maintaining a regular, you know, light dark cycle, these kinds of things. And, and there's been a couple of studies in, in cancer patients where if they kind of get say, uh, if they get their chemo or their drugs in a certain timing, they might have a higher chance of tumor regression than other patients. These kinds of things where it's like the only thing you're really changing is when you administer a drug, for example. And, and that could have huge impacts on, you know, how quickly you metabolize a, a drug, you know, all, all these things, how much side effects you might get from it. Some, in some cases, um, there might not be any, but in other cases there will be, but because that is never taken into account. You just don't really know until you do these studies. Um, and, and it probably has so much potential. Um, and, and I've kind of started seeing it, I, I guess, last year or something like that, that people have started to try and promote these chronobiology diets. That's the only place I've really seen it oh trying to be capitalized on. Well, you know, where it's like, oh, you should eat this and that, then, you know, and... I mean, there's always trying to make the newest diet, but yeah, exactly. there could be a grain of truth to it. There could be it could a grain be. of truth to it. It could be a grain of truth to it, but then you're also supposed to live a, a normal life, right? So then it's, yeah. Right. And I, you know, here's a perfect example. Like you're saying, things are actually really inexpensive to try and help these people that have to do this shift work, like having yeah. lights that have a daylight, a true daylight spectrum in them so that you're getting vitamin D even if you're not being out in the sun. But that's okay, maybe you can do some stuff at work, but what about their home? Like it only takes just a tiny bit of light leak into your bedroom and it absolutely disrupts the quality of your sleep and it doesn't take very much. So how many people actually take the time to make their sleeping room a black a true blackout room where there's no light leak and th uh, that you know would also really help but that's also that's actually not that easily done for most people yeah and um you know most yeah a lot of people have family small children you know it's just it's just not possible to do but i think we are just um, like going back to what we talked about earlier, it's one of these kind of um, silent polluters, right? We're just not really aware of it being being around us. And, and the only time you really see it, really, really see it, is, is if you're out trying to stargaze and then you go, ah, oh, so much light pollution from, you know, like there's a car over there, or, you know, or, or somebody has, um, you know, this really strong um, LED light bulb outside of their house that is ruining everything, you know, these, these things that you don't really notice uh, you don't really think about you it do. until, until you really try and seek out darkness. Um, and uh, I think it's a problem both for humans and also for a lot of, of night active animals. We are really disrupting their biology. I think the most kind of extreme case would be, you know, turtle hatchings where they're supposed to, when they hatch, they go out towards the full moon at sea. Like they, they, they are basically doing what we call photo taxis, where we, you go to either away or towards light. And they go towards the strongest light, which are now a city rather than the sea. And then, then you they get, go the wrong way. Then you go the wrong way. And then you have a problem, you know, 
you already have a problem with with these endangered animals because the gender balance is wrong because the sea temperature is now changed and their gender is determined by the temperature of the sea you have a now even bigger problem because you get a lot of the new generation that kind of go the wrong way right and and those are really ex extreme um examples well we're but living in an extreme really world right now <laughs> yeah yeah but you know a lot of other animals that we don't probably think about that much also use you know use or don't use light in a particular way and we are just totally oblivious to it right we we are we we notice plastic pollution but we don't notice the other pollutions that we have around us and i think that's that's interesting and um and also well, we're, gonna, we're gonna loop back to that because there's one major thing that i want to talk about is that you've created a way that now we can look at uh like dark cycle in a species that's evolved to exist in the dark and we also have its parent species which is still living above ground which makes it number one this perfect test bed because it's the same species yeah it's just one has evolved to develop in the light so uh what are the major differences that you see between the cells from the cave fish versus their uh above ground dwelling uh ancestors the surface fish, yeah. their surface um, ancestors yes um so for the in the in the molecular biology the 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 clock we see that the the timing is now different which so instead of so on a when you look at these clock genes in in animals you basically kind of get a peak in a trough and that peak is changed in the loss of the cave fish it's different they react differently to light than their surface um, counterpart in the caves and the cave the mexican blind cave fish we don't think they have been in the case for that long there are a couple of studies that have tried to determine it now with with whole genome sequencing to try and calibrate when they got isolated and anywhere between you know 20 30 thousand years ago to a hundred and something thousand years ago so not very long while we have other species of cave fish we don't have that river fish anymore like the somalian blind cave fish um where we see that there is a total breakdown of, of any clock at all so you can if you are willing to go outside of your own study species you, you know that there is there will be an eventual total breakdown of all the light and circadian biology and because they don't they need it anymore so they, they don't need it they, they don't need it, it anymore. but also a lot of those genes were important in timing other things of their biology so the rest of their biology will now have to be timed in a different way or not timed at all so it kind of have to be consecutively kind of turned on or turned off or whatever you know will benefit them so for some of the like a DNA repair enzyme that we see in the in the Mexican blind cave fish is kind of now constantly turned on in the dark while in the surface fish you have to have light for it to be turned on but like the base of level of that is always higher in the cave one for example so that's a neat way of how they have used the light biology now in the dark so if you had looked at their transcription profile blindly you would have thought it was actually in constant light rather than in constant darkness because that's the way that they have evolved to it and i think um i've also uh, back in 2017, I went on this deep sea cruise and tried to fish for some deep sea fish, another type of animal that have adapted to the dark. And they, cave fish are difficult. Deep sea fish are different level of difficult to work with. I have to say. <laughs> and, that, and you, you want to talk about cost of of doing research? That's like, yeah, I think one day of of a cruise like that is fifty thousand euros per day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't pay yeah, I'm a fisherman. And I'm, wow. <laughs> so so the samples you get from those things, right, are, are super, super important. But I think and the craziest think, looking things ever, like angler fish and stuff like that. Just yeah. insane looking yeah. species. 
Yeah, because, um, yeah, especially in that kind of that area around a thousand to 500 meters, you still have a tiny, tiny bit of light in the, in the sea. So you still have ice on the fish and you have these other crazy adaptations that that still means that they can take advantage of light and they have bioluminescence there as well. So they can signal to each other or they can avoid prey or attract prey using using light. So so they're, they're pretty cool. They're, but I think we can learn. I think it's a kind of a classic biological view of things that you can learn things about how you work yourself or how humans work or how the animals work by studying something that works in the complete opposite way right so you go 100 percent. so i think that's the the strength with a lot of the the cavefish um cavefish work and and also i think a lot of research these days you know it's very driven to you know we want a concrete output you know there's very little basic research that is permitted at least that's the feeling in well now i'm in australia and i've also had the feeling in europe where it's like they want a concrete outcome for humans well for the cavefish for example they've also figured out that they probably can't really get diabetic because of their way that they have evolved um to this food uh and a uh, availability that it's it's not really there and then all of a sudden there's lots of it and then you know so they have so to be able to process massive amounts of food while it's around because it could be gone and therefore they they can't allow for insulin shock or anything like that because otherwise they wouldn't be able to take in all the calories that they absolutely need because they don't know how long it's going to be before they get fed again yeah. Oh, so so it's but it's a funny thing, right? Because you probably that was never the point of of having cavefish in the lab to begin with. But then all of a sudden you figure out that that is a, a thing, and then maybe that will eventually become useful to humans. But you don't actually really know that until you've looked at it. And a lot of research probably won't end up with much. But that will also be the case for these really target driven things. So. You know, you're bringing up so many good points that I want to talk about. So I just want to talk about this one last thing about your research. Yeah. And then I want to go back to these other topics because okay. they're also like when you're talking about basic science, and I've already discussed this on a few other podcasts, but it can never be said enough. The basic science is the foundation, period. And to, you know, our government wants to get rid of the NSF entirely because it has, well, how does it help humans that we study, you know, how this animal species mates? Why is that important? Well, you don't know why it's important necessarily. So you tear it apart, but you might find that in this study of this one animal's mating behavior, you solve 20 different questions that you had no idea that you were going to solve to begin with. And yeah, you have a lot of good ideas. So I want to come back to that, but here's maybe the coolest thing about your research in this one project is it appears that this may have happened with this cave fish may have independently evolved from the surface fish multiple times so yeah it it may be that any time that we can compare a surface dweller to a cave dweller that we have this incredible opportunity to look at convergent evolution and yeah. how many different ways biology can overcome the same problem yeah I think the cavefish is really a gift pack to anybody that studies evolutionary biology, right? And I think um, I recently also wrote a chapter about cavefish in general for fish, fish physiology, where I tried to take some of the other species of cavefish around and kind of look at, you know, especially there's not that many, there's not that many genomes available, but you know, are there any genes that are under particular, you know, selection, you know, can we find, and generally speaking, 
like the photopigments are under, but not the, the same one always. This this different, right? So, but it's basically evolution that tries to come up with the thing by targeting different genes. And we kind of end up with the same looking fish often, right? We get these really pale eyeless animals that really have over then developed their other sensory structures. Um, sometimes it's lateral lines, right? These little um, organs that they use to, to feel vibrations in the water and, and, and other things. Sometimes it's hearing smell. Um, and it is really cool. Um, and we see the convergent evolution in, in the Mexican blind cavefish, but we also see it in the other species of cavefish. Um, and there's so much, there's so many things that are so cool if you look at the cavefish as a whole, and that is species from the same genera have been isolated in caves on different continents far apart from each other, you know, so they're really predisposed to be okay in caves. And then they've also evolved to kind of have the same phenotype. So kind of they're, they're already predisposed to, to be able to kind of find things in probably dark, murky waters or whatever. But then there have been a cave there and then they have been isolated there. And then they have managed to both survive there and evolve for tens of thousands of years. You know, maybe one in Africa and one in Australia. I mean, how incredible is that independent of each other? Yeah, absolutely. And like where I first learned about uh, convergent evolution is the uh, the Arctic cod and the uh, Antarctic ice fish, both of which live in you know <clears throat> sub sub freezing water, and they both have the same antifreeze protein. It's the exact same peptide, but it was created. Uh, in two totally different ways genetically. One was, and, and from different gene products, completely different gene products, but ultimately made the same exact antifreeze peptide. So that was where I learned about it. I was like, wow, that's, you know, really cool. But from a perspective of what you're talking about, who knows how much we can learn? Uh, a, number one, like, well, why did this cavefish population have have a much better uh, vertical line uh, improvement in their sensory perception, but this other one didn't? They're both successful. Why is this one's lateral line more sensitive than this one? You know, and then vice versa. Well, this one can smell food, you know, uh, half a mile away in the cave, and the other one can't. But they still both exist. They still look very similar. Why do these things happen? You know, can we learn something about how their environment changed that why one would be different from the other, but then even just to compare the genes and proteins they make themselves as to, well, these ones are not, did you find any proteins that were modified differently in one versus the other, like specific proteins, either activity and or uh, gene proteins themselves? So most of the work that we have done and other people as well is on transcript level only, right? So it's just mRNA basically. Um, but I think now that especially proteomics and phosphoproteomics are, have really kind of evolved quite a bit in, in their accuracy. I think that might be a technology that is now worth trying out on, on some of these because this is always the, the criticism for, for working with transcripts, right? With, with, with what? So for the people who don't know, DNA makes RNA, right? That's the, that's the recipe for the proteins. But one piece of RNA doesn't make one piece of protein. And slightly different RNA might mean that the protein is folded slightly differently and they will do different things or they might get different um, post-translational um, mutations. Yeah, right. So, um, so, so you can't take a transcript and say, okay, well, then it does this as a protein. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. 
but due to the kind of technology and it used to only be like antibodies that you could really do, which is really expensive. And it also means that you have to buy a couple of rabbits and inject, you know, all these things that, that you, it, and it, not it, only it gets, that you end up with data. That's not quantity, not easily to quantitate and yeah, allows, exactly. and allows people to publish uh, lots of very dubious uh, work to yeah. say the least. Yeah, so for that reason, um, we haven't we don't have much protein data on on the cavefish, unfortunately. But I think that that would be a lot of the next level um, things. And and but as like far you as said, I, it's coming. Yeah, as as far as I can can tell from people who know proteomics and and mass spec as a technology, it seems like that is something that is evolving even faster now than sequencing technology. And it will actually be pretty affordable because that's another thing when, when, when you do research, right? You have to, if you don't have a massive grant, you have to really budget, you know, am I going to spend money on this or am I going to spend money on that? I might get some data from this, and I might not get some data from that, you know, that's very, that's too exploratory. Um, you know, should I really put my eggs in that basket? So, um, well, this so brings us back to what we should probably be talking about. And that <laughs> is, and that is when, when you have, I don't think most people realize how hard it is to get funding as an academic scientist. And it's because we have to do things that people want to fund. They want yeah. to fund this thing. Now, what also happens in that case, though, is that the people that are delivering the money for the funding, well, they're influenced by how well rated was your publication? How, what's your pedigree? What universities did you attend? Who were your mentors? Uh, the, what are the what are the perceived chances of you succeeding? You yeah. Know, so many of those things are well. Actually, they're all qualitative. They're all qualitative. So it's really just kind of a beauty pageant. It not it's not what people think it is that oh you write this great proposal and you know. It's all about just how, what are the merits of it? It really has very little to do with the merits of it and a lot more to do with the politics of it. And then on top of that, the people that are really in control are not even scientists for the most part. They're governmental figures or they're CEOs of nonprofits that don't understand the science at all. And therefore they're, listening to advisors who if they're biased can make the things go whatever way they want and and what it and what it does is it leads to the only projects that get funded are things that are supposedly low risk high impact but really they're all high risk high impact because all science is pretty risky and then yeah. Uh, you end up with, and you don't get to research any of these cool things like you're doing because, or it's hard to get funding for those things because you don't have the, the crystal ball to tell you all of the interesting science and discovery that will come out of the project. You have an idea, but you don't know. Well, it's kind of easy to sweep cave fish back into the cave now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And no, I think there's so much that can be said for the, the grant funding systems. Right. I think at the, I mean, and they also go in waves, right? If, if economies are doing really well, there's usually more money for research. It's a, you know, it kind of usually tracks with culture as well. You know, that if there's a bloom in culture, there's also a bloom in, in science basically. But I think when you are um, you are down between five and ten percent chance of getting funding, that means that you have to put in somewhere between ten and twenty grants each year, every other year, or whatever. 
in order to cover, you know, to say, well, at least statistically now I, I might may or may not get, get a grant, right? And that is, you spend a lot of time writing things and thinking of you spend things. More time, do you personally spend more time writing grants than you do in the lab? Uh, pro probably, well, I'm still relatively early in my career, so I've been lucky. I would probably say I spend, I would say it's a 30% grant slash paperwork thing and then a 70% research slash writing thing for me at the moment. But I know that as I will progress later in my career, it will probably flick to 70, 80% of just trying to get money and doing administrative work um, and then only really having very little time for research. And, and, that, and that's not what it's supposed to be. It's not it's what it's supposed, not what it's supposed to, be. to be. And I think also the current the current system that we have is also not great because it selects for people who can do a little bit of everything, but it selects out people who so you have to be quite good at writing, you have to be quite good at giving presentations, you have to have okay ideas, you have to be able to execute them and you have to be able to to write a paper and something. But the people who say are really good scientists but might not be great at writing things, and there are quite a lot of them, they get what? booted out instantly because the, the the academic structure we have is pyramidal, right? You start off and you have your undergrads and you have your grads and your PhDs, and then you have your postdocs, and then you have your lecturers and then your professors. And, and, and the thing is that in order to get to that kind of professor level, you have to be able to do a little bit of everything and you the people who just want to to sit there and potter around and do research who, who might be really good at that they're not respected that they're not respected and you're not going to get any grants because you're not writing them because they're not good enough or you might not be good enough at writing papers and i i, I see it particularly with um maybe the generation a, a couple of generations over me uh, like researchers from other countries that don't speak English that well because they never learned it in school, really struggle. You know, some of them are brilliant scientists with really good ideas and they have really great merits and then it kind of just stops because they don't have the intricate English skills that you need in order to to write something that, that is good and, and concise. And they just get, you know, they are never going to do science again. And I think that is a big... It's a big problem. It's and... criminal. It really yeah. is. It's like, you know, they make us compete. Scientists should not be competing. And I don't know what the system is where we don't compete. But yeah. ultimately, there will be less r fraudulent research. That's A number one. If yeah. you take competition out of the system, I mean... Roughly, you know, 60% of what's published is wrong, or it will turn out to be wrong, maybe even a little more than that in the future. Now, there's a certain portion of that that is wrong because uh, we didn't have good enough measurement device because so that was what it was then. But when yeah. we improve the measurement device, now this is what it is and it changes it. Well, that's yeah. a totally different kind of being wrong than what's going on with the president from Stanford falsifying Western blot data in multiple papers to get these prestigious papers in journals so that his career can continue to progress so that he can get to a $2 million salary and be the president of a major university. Now that's the psychopath part of it. And if you're in science, you're probably a little competitive just because it's the nature of it. Like, in not you don't have to be competitive even against other people. You're just competitive even against yourself. Like, I want to learn all of this tomorrow. You know, and you can't, yeah. and you drive yourself. Maybe, maybe driven is a better word. Scientists yeah, are very I, driven. Yeah, I, I think... I think science is more like a sport, really, right? It is a competition about, you know, who can who can run the fastest or, or, or whatever. 
Um, but I think a lot of people go into it with this idea that they really, that they're super curiosity driven or that they want to change something. They want to change the world. They want to discover a new drug. They want to, I don't know, help nature, help an animal, you know, whatever it is. So I think a lot of people come in with it with, with pretty pure intentions and a, it's not a, it's not the best paid job. It gives you a lot of freedom in, in many ways. And but well, you just brought up what I was going to say, because uh, as tenure or as faculty or even as a postdoc, like no one ever talks to you, or at least they never did were in any place I was about vacation or how much time off you're allowed. Like they don't, you, you're allowed basically un, in, in your contract, you're allowed basically unlimited time off. But yeah. they can offer that to us because we'll never, ever use it. Exactly. This is the thing, <laughs> right? You, you, and it's, it's, it's also strange because some universities will, will also make you take holiday, which is like you have to take holiday and, and, and then people, you know, sit there and have like a month of holiday and then they're in their office, but they're not really supposed to be in, in their office. And I think, in many ways, it's great because if you, you know, if anything happens in your family or something like that, you can really, um, unless you, of course, lecture or something like that, you can you can usually step out for a couple of weeks and nothing. And will the world to... won't fall apart. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and nobody will be be upset. And I think that's one of the greatest things. Um, but of course, that that shrinks the the higher up the pyramid you get because more and more people are getting dependent on you and you you know you you have students that work under you you have other postdocs that work you have maybe if you have a, a big lab you might have a couple of tech people so so you know it it, it normally foster you, you have there is a lot of responsibility that you usually end up with anyway and and then there's lecturing and then there's exam grading and then there's all the other things that you might or may not have to do and then all of these courses that you might have to now sit where you get questioned you know what what are the values you know how how are you training your people to be the best versions of themselves or whatever so um it's yeah i think that that freedom disappears relatively quickly as well but you can take it if you if if you time it correctly um, my my deal when i was a postdoc is if i published a paper that i allowed mm -hmm. myself a week off like that was my <laughs> Till I published 14 papers in a year. And then I was like, oh, you can't really take a week off every time you publish a paper. But, uh, well, it just so happened that way. Some of them were hung up in the pipeline for a very long time. You know what I mean? That People don't realize sometimes papers can be, you can have a result for years, many years sometimes, before anybody ever really knows about it outside yeah. of people at meetings because you can't get it published or yeah you know get re spend five six months at nature and they reject it but you're like well it almost got in so let me send it to science and then you let it spend eight months at science and then it gets rejected and then you're like well let me send it to plus biology and then you let it there for five months and then it gets rejected and then you're like well let me send it to plus one and then all of a sudden that takes six months and then it finally gets published i mean i had a paper like that and it's to my knowledge it's either the first or one of the very first uh neuronal organoids that was ever published and they just wouldn't publish it no I mean, it was in nature neuroscience. I, I, I did the whole gambit. I was like, no, we have a hippocampus growing in a dish. Like, this is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, you don't. And everything you're looking at is just happenstance. Those are not parallel fibers that you're looking at. I mean, we had these parallel fibers growing in a dish and curling around, just like you would see in a rat brain that were you know, hundreds of microns long. And, you know, cause you could move multiple microscope fields and still be on the same parallel lines. And 
got rejected in nature neuroscience because no, we, you know, even though we showed the proteins that are in those cells were expressed there, even though we went back and did umpteen number of experiments. Yes, they have these receptors. Yes, they, you know, they have calcium oscillations the way they're supposed to. Da, 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 da. No, because we can't, you can't grow a brain in a dish. And I wish I hadn't thrown those first reviews away because I would love to post them now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now that neuronal organoids are kind of like hot stuff, you know, it's like one of the big deals right now. Yeah. And that kind of stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's, that's the other thing that is very strange with science is the whole publishing thing, right? It's the, the fact that you pay people to publish your research and that you do work for free to review other people's work for journals and, and all these things. Oh, on, on it, top okay. of the, the taxpayers pay for you to pay the journal to publish the work, your research that the taxpayers also help to fund if you have government funding, but the taxpayer also has to pay to read the journal that they paid yeah. for the work and they paid to have it published. Yeah. It's insanity. It is that it is, yeah, like every time. Because the thing is, also, you then go around and you look at, well, how much will it cost me to publish here? Does my university have a deal, read and, and publish agreement with this journal? Does it not have it? Uh, it, is, it is just mind-boggling that you are expected to do this, this reviewing work for free. And you might do a lot of reviews every year. And then... On top of that, if you want to publish in the same journal, you have to pay for it. And it's not like a hundred bucks. It's like Thousands. five, ten, twenty, you know, like it is it is an insane amount of money, especially in, in the high journals. And then you get these predatory journals which will publish basically anything because people will pay them and they won't go through very um rigorous the reviews will be much more sloppy right the editor can send it out to review the reviewers can say well actually i think it's you know not good or, or whatever and then the editor can go i don't care we're going to publish it anyway so they can say it's been through review but then actually it hasn't really so it's it's another part of of science that is just incredible and and it's also funny that these people who are supposedly so smart are agreeing to this system and i mean i'm one of well, them because i it's your currency. Your publications are your currency, right? And I think this well, pre- I'm not speaking stuff. for you, but what I do yeah. want to say is part of what I want to do with this is I'm really hoping to organize, like that this will start some kind of trickle down organizing where, because for me to get out, I've been out of academia for a decade. So I can look at it having been in it but I can also look at it a much better now as an outsider. Yeah. And uh, I think that we are desperate as a scientific community for kind of the next Copenhagen interpretation of how you're even supposed to do science. How are we going to, how much is being wasted with so many people doing the same experiments around the world why are we doing that for competition how much money is being wasted on negative results not being published yeah. so that i don't go try and do the same one because it doesn't work look it doesn't work see i already did it here's 10 replicates this thing does not work this way you can't yeah. get that published meanwhile right. to 10 labs around the world you might have saved them a million dollars if they had that information. Yeah, it is. It is a big. It is a really, really big problem. Um, and it is. It is incredible that it is like that because it's. I mean, science is basically being driven like Victorian England is still. You know, like it, we're still following the same rules of like you know, eighteen hundreds. Um, you know, gen gentlemen's. You know, like it's. Or even even earlier than that, right? You do a bit of astronomy, maybe a bit of astrology on the side, and then you're an architect and you build half of London, and then you also do a bit of, um, you know, 
bio biological research on the side or whatever you know it's and and that's kind of how a lot of this started and it's still how a lot of it is being approached being, yeah and it's you know it, it and that is incredible that we haven't because obviously it's it's completely different now right it's it's you you you're not never one scientist anymore right you're usually a team of people who do things and but you still have one person that gets to kind of claim ultimate you know yeah, glory so they for... want you to be independent they want you to be independent why i published 50 papers with the same person and everybody would give i mean it was hard to do because they kept trying to separate us well you're going to yeah. ruin your career and you're going to you know you need to show that you're independent. And if you're always working with the same person, how do people know that you're, who's doing the work? If yeah. you're both publishing often and well, who cares where it's coming from, number one? And number two, why would you try and break up that team? Clearly they're productive. And yeah. two heads are better than one. I'm sorry, it is. Yeah, it's, it is. It's incredible and um, yeah, and problematic. And, and probably a lot of people have then become, you know, enemies after, after having to try and break it up. Because where do you draw the line of what is yours and what belongs to the other person? And, and, you know, and you might then run with these parallel ideas for years to come and, and do a lot of the same research. And that has happened think, many a time in, in I think it's uh, a, the history a really of science. Problem, yeah. So, um, yeah, I like during my whole research career, I've pretty much been a lone wolf. So I'm really keen on being part of a of a bigger team, but I'm actually finding it nowadays really difficult. And especially, you know, what I can uh, the fellowships that I can apply for, it's like you're not allowed to have any collaborators. You're not. You know, there's all these rules where you are really not. How can you not? You know, how can you exist without collaborators? How? Yeah. So everything will have to happen in the space of that one lab that you have chosen. You know, it's it's very strange that they kind of try and embody this one person show, um, because it's it's really difficult to get anything done by yourself. I yeah, mean, it you is. Like, a builder to build a house by himself but like well you have to do the plumbing and the electricity and you have to actually design the house like why you wouldn't ask anybody else to do it so why would you it's yeah it's yeah well uh, the system is very strange I, first of all i love your idea about we really do need to rethink our victorian area era way of uh doing science and I promise you at some point down the road, I'm going to send you something and I hope you jump on board with it. But <laughs> to, to, to kind of wrap this up on a positive note, what, what do you love about being a scientist? What, what is the thing that makes you get out of bed in the morning and be like, because we, we're all like this. We all think about what's going on in the lab and you know, where is that next data coming from for me to analyze in and what do you love about it? Well, I think part, well, if I'm going to start with the negative first, I think a part of it is just fear that you really have to get your stuff done. If not, your you know, your, your career <laughs> is over. Um, but the, the freedom of being a scientist and being allowed to kind of go down and explore a lot of different pathways um, are, is incredible. Right. And, especially the way I set myself up, right? I have this core molecular biology base and then I can basically work with any animal that I find interesting, right? I'm interested in seasonal biology. I'm interested in light biology. So okay, like I have this, this base and then I have a couple of techniques in the lab that I know work really well. And then I can, you know, I, I, I get to go to beautiful locations, field work, you know, currently at the Great Barrier Reef um incredible right Ooh, not, yeah, a spoiled. People, <laughs> not a lot of people get to go and do those things and you sometimes you have to you know we like to complain a lot uh but sometimes you also just have to take a step back and go look you know i'm so lucky that i get to really just explore the world um and and how it works and and how it fits together and okay it's a very very small piece of the puzzle but 
it's nonetheless really interesting. And, and I think getting a graph where you have statistical significance, it's like when you really thought that something is, and then you get the data that something, you know, that, that you get, you know, your hypothesis gets confirmed is like, and to anybody else, it's just this like badly plotted thing in Excel, right? Your initial thing. And you just go like, but that bar is like this and that bar is like that. And look at the statistics, it adds up. And, and you just, and I think, and then you only live on that for like five minutes and then you have to go do something else. But I think. <laughs> it's so true. That's so true. But it is the, when you get results that you, even if it's a negative result, if you can statistically rule it out in a negative, yeah. that, you may not be as happy, but you're still happy because that means you can turn off whatever that thing was and yeah. move now in a new direction. And sometimes those are like the magic moments where yeah. you get the, the really good negative result telling you stop going this way. And then you get to have a glass of wine and look up at the stars and all of a sudden 20 ideas of why that not being the road opens up these other roads. Yeah, it's exactly. just mentally exciting. And it's, I think that like we're having a great conversation and you can see in our face, you can see in our faces the excitement when we talk about certain things and it's 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 because it's magical. It, it's this magical experience of doing something that's completely analytical. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is strange, but kind of when it all comes together and you can you can tell a story about something, you know, people wouldn't really think it's particularly glamorous to sit and blow up embryos in the in the lab, but then all of a sudden you can tell a story about about cavefish and, and how their biology works and, and you know, the and how they evolved and yeah, and, and their light biology and, and, and all these things. And then you can, you know, set it into systems with, with other animals. And I think kind of creating that story in a way, although I'm, I don't love writing articles, I have to say, but, but when you kind of look at it retrospectively, you kind of go like, Oh yeah, that was, that was actually pretty, that was nice. That was, that was good. And, other, some papers are more exciting than others because, you know, some animals are cooler than others or some results are cooler than others. But I think contributing to that puzzle is really, is really neat. And it is a, it is a privilege to be able to do it. And yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I feel like the fact that I got to do it the way I did it for as long as I did it, that if I were to die tomorrow, I lived a good life. I got to experience, you know, I got to really do a lot of things that not a lot of people in this world get to do. And that doesn't make it, that's not what makes it great though. What made it great is I got to do it and experience the people doing it with me. And that, I mean, there's something very special about 2 a.m. arguments in a bar after a conference talk. Like, that's a very, very special situation that you can't ever really put into words, yet uh, will change, could change your whole life, could change your career, could change everything. And it's that, and it, but it's from the interaction with the others that are doing it with you. And that, I just, has always been part of my favorite thing about science in general just yeah. and part of why I'm doing this because I love to just talk about science and I love to talk to the people that are doing it and I really appreciate you for taking the time to do this today this was fantastic and I hope that uh when you publish your next paper or you have a cool result that you're taking to a uh, meeting that you hit me up and maybe we'll talk some more yeah sure thank you for inviting me it's very very kind of you to uh, take an interest in the cavefish it it's very interesting in and of itself <laughs> well thank you inga and uh uh hope to hear from you soon yeah sure thank you very much right, right. have a lovely evening you too
All right, bye-bye. Okay.